Hello, my name is Lisa Duncanson. I'm the Bar Exam Guru, founder and owner of Bar None Review and Bar Exam Crime Session. You can find our blog at baregzamguru.com. Please follow it. There's lots of free things there for you if you're studying for the bar, if you're studying for law school. So today I wanted to go over a First Amendment speech approach. This is primarily for the essays, but once you actually know this approach, it will help you on the MBs as well to discern what part of the First Amendment speech approach they're testing. It really helps to have that understood. So there are five steps to our approach. And by the way, this is the approach that the California bar examiners have embraced. And it's what the Supreme Court follows when they're addressing a First Amendment speech issue. So the first step is to state the general rule. The general rule for First Amendment speech starts this way. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. This is incorporated via the 14th Amendment to the states, or this is incorporated to the states via the 14th Amendment. Having those two parts of the general rule sets you apart from everyone else who misses that. And I would say most people fail to address that at all. They might even just have First Amendment as a heading and go right to content-based versus content-neutral, which is our second step. So the first step is Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. This is incorporated to the states via the 14th Amendment. Step number two, is this regulation content-based or content-neutral? A tip here, usually you have to address both. It may be screaming to you that it's content-based, and that's great, and you're probably right. If it seems to be a content-based uh, restriction. But it could also be that the government can argue that there's a reasonable time, place, and manner restriction and that this should be okay under the Constitution, under time, place, and manner content-neutral regulations. The third step is to go over prior restraint. The fourth step is overbreath, and the fifth step is vagueness. So I, those are the three prior, prior restraint, overbreath, and vagueness that many people fail to address. Why do they fail to address it? Because it isn't screaming out at you. There's nothing that says that it is overly broad. There's nothing that says that it keeps people from speaking. But here's the thing. You have to address these three points. I call it point of view. Prior restraint for the P, O for the overbreath, and V for vagueness, just to help remember it. So its first step is general rule. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of states. This is a freedom of speech. This is incorporated to the states via the 14th Amendment. And then second step, is this regulation or ordinance content-based or content-neutral? Discuss both. And then you move on to the third, fourth, and fifth steps, which if they are missing, and they often are, that's a fail. There's no way you can pass a First Amendment speech exam at all without these required steps. And it's so easy to miss. So you want to go in there armed with this approach and make sure that you go through it step by step. So let's talk a little bit about prior restraint, overbreath, and vagueness. They're always at issue on every First Amendment exam. So what does that mean? It means you have to tick it off. Even if it isn't an unconstitutional prior restraint, you have to address it because any regulation on speech, any regulation on speech is a prior restraint. The issue is whether or not it's an unconstitutional prior restraint. That's your issue. Is it an unconstitutional prior restraint? So examples of what would be an unconstitutional prior restraint would be speech, an ordinance about speech that restricts it. And if you violate the ordinance, there's a fine or imprisonment, uh, a crime attached. So it could be a misdemeanor and a $500 fine. That should tell you, ooh, I have a prior restraint issue here. It doesn't mean it's unconstitutional, but you're getting into that area. But if you don't have facts like that, you still have to address prior restraint. You can't leave that exam and think you're going to pass it without doing that. Over breadth. So that's always an issue, even if the facts don't pose it. But let's talk about how a regulation could be overly broad such that it's unconstitutional. Because again, 
it doesn't necessarily have to be overly broad for you to address it. You have to address it. So here, if you have a fact pattern that says that uh, no advertising in the town center can portray women in a demeaning and sexist fashion. So what does that mean? It means something different to everybody. And that statue also goes on to attach a $500 fine if you advertise in a way that they can call demeaning and sexist. And it could, and also results in a misdemeanor, which is a criminal charge. So that would be a statute that would be overly broad because it's not clear. It could absolutely restrict protected speech. A picture of a lady in a bathing suit might be offensive to somebody, but it's certainly allowed speech. Obscenity, of course, would not be allowed. So they can restrict the placement of naked pictures and things like that, but you can't, uh, you know, it includes both protected and unprotected speech. So it's not narrow enough, it's overly broad. So if you don't have any facts like that, then you're gonna handle it with a heading for overly for overbreadth and say here there's nothing in the facts to suggest that this statute is overly broad. It is clear what they're trying to regulate, so this is not an issue. Then you move on to vagueness. Now vagueness is the one where you look at whether the words of the statute are something that everyone of common intelligence would be able to understand the meaning of the speech. So there's no guessing as to the meaning of the law or differing of what that can, how it can be interpreted. So if it's overly vague, then it can be void for vagueness. And that's a common way that we say it, void for vagueness if it's unclear what it actually means. If people of common intelligence would differ as to their interpretation, then it's probably overly vague. So you can have an exam that brings out all of those things. The hypo, the, the example I gave you said you cannot portray women in advertising in a demeaning and sexist way. That's definitely vague. What does that even mean? So it clicks off your prior restraint being unconstitutional because there's a fine attached and also because, you know, so people are going to be afraid to do anything, any kind of advertising that portrays women because it might be demeaning you know, and they don't want to be fined $500 and they don't want to have a misdemeanor on their record. And it's void for vagueness because it's not clear what it even means. What is that, what is offensive, demeaning, or sexist? It's different for everybody. So you can check off all of those. But if you don't have any facts like that, you simply say, here, while the regulation does restrain speech about X, Y, and Z, it is not an unconstitutional, it does not appear to be an unconstitutional prior restraint. Move on to the next one, which is over breath. Here, the facts do not indicate that this statute is overly broad. I know that sounds conclusory, it is, and that's what they wanna see, if that's the actual case. And then finally, under vagueness here, the statute does not appear to be over, to be void for vagueness. It's not vague, it's clear as to what uh, the statute means and people of common intelligence would understand. So you can even be shorter than that. If there are no issues, meaning there are no facts to generate a real discussion about prior restraint, overbreath, and vagueness, you can have a heading that says prior restraint, comma, overbreath, comma, vagueness. Visually, that tells them right away that you're addressing that. You have to use headings. You want to use headings like signposts. Here I'm going. I'm talking about this now. I'm moving on to the next point that you need to give me. Moving on to the next points that you need to give me. So if it's just a quick you know, dismissal of those three last uh, requirements for a successful First Amendment speech essay answer, then you can put all three uh, across. Um, I recommend using caps for headings because the formatting on an exam can go awry under exam soft and whatever programs are using. Sometimes if you go to underline a heading, it'll underline all of the text, even though it doesn't appear that way to you. But I've seen many exams of students who come to me having taken the bar multiple times and the formatting just isn't what they saw 
on their system when they were typing it in. So caps, even if they get pushed around and end up in a different spot on your exam, they're gonna pretty much assume that that's a heading that you intended it that way. So that's a safe thing to do. So headings are pretty much the guide for the grader. You gotta make this an easy task for them. You want to immediately, when they open your book, your exam book, typed or handwritten, most of you are using laptops, and uh, if you're doing that, you, have, you wanna get the immediate benefit of the doubt. You want that essay to immediately scream out, it's passing. And how do you do that? You have the headings that reflect the issues that you're addressing and the issues must be correct. So reading a 150 out page outline for contracts or con law is not going to get you better at spotting issues. If you can't spot the issues, you can't pass the exam, plain and simple. So the most important thing of course, you need to know the substance of law, but you need to know how it's tested so that you can be sure of yourself on exam day that you're going to pick up the correct issues. So I will be uh, providing additional videos. I'm going to wrap it up now, um, but I'm going to provide additional videos about how to display, how to format, how to write your essay. So I hope you enjoyed this and have a better feeling about First Amendment speech should you get it. So one more time, five-step approach to First Amendment speech issues. The first step is Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. This is incorporated to the states via the 14th Amendment. That first step and heading will separate you from everybody else. Step number two, is the speech content neutral or is it content based. Step number three, is this a prior restraint? Meaning, is it an unconstitutional prior restraint? You can dismiss that in a sentence if it's not at issue, posed by the facts, or you'll have a full analysis. Step number four is over breadth. These should all be headings, prior restraint, over breadth. And then the third, the fifth step is vagueness. So think of it this way. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech incorporated in the states. Is the law, is the regulation content based or content neutral? POV, prior restraint, overbreath, and vagueness. Think of it as point of view. First Amendment, one, two, three, four, five. That's it. Okay, you do that. You have headings. Even if your writing isn't perfect, as the release stances are never perfect, you'll be fine. Not only will you be fine, you'll probably get extra points for doing what most people don't provide. You've got to make these easy to read for the grader, easier for them to give you points. That's the whole goal. So I'll be providing more approaches. If you're interested in having all of the approaches for all the most likely tested areas, please uh, sign up for our bar exam cram session, which is on February 13th. It's a Saturday, full day, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, we cover uh, everything that we can in that one day, which is most of the topics, and we focus on what is upcoming. I make bar exam predictions, which I'm known for. Um, but the most important thing is that students lead that session with confidence that these are rules that you can actually memorize. So just to give you an idea, here is the cram sheet on the First Amendment. So this is how brief it is. Um, and, you know, this is one of many approaches in this 50 page book. Okay, so we're updating it constantly to reflect what has been tested. But all of these approaches come from the years and years of past bar exams and what the California bar examiners have embraced. And we also do prep for the uniform bar exam. So if any of you who are watching this or taking that exam in February, we can help you with that as well. All the best of luck to you studying and uh, please follow our blog at baregzamguru.com. Thank you.